Look, listen. I know you're running, right? But just listen. Just hear me for a minute. Just listen for a minute. All right? Just listen. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Random Thoughts and Ideas with Jack. I am your guy, Jack. And this is a podcast about just random thoughts and ideas about everything and everyday life, concepts, mental health, uh, relationships, whether it be a romantic or family. And it also a place to get some life saving or money saving DIY tips. So I want to encourage you guys to like, subscribe, and even comment. Comment on any thoughts, any ideas that you um, might have heard, like, or dislike. Any tips, any questions you might have, just shoot them in the comments. Remember, you can find me on all of my handles. Um, you go to my anchor page, you can find it. Um, my handles on YouTube, Instagram, RRTI with Jack. So listen up, listen in, and enjoy. Okay, guys. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. This is episode 6 of Random Thoughts and Ideas with Jack. Today's episode, as I promised, will be a DIY, do-it-yourself. So tips and tricks for care maintenance and how to reduce your fuel consumption. We all know you're all feeling that pain of almost 2 US dollars a liter. Four Barbados dollars, four Barbados for one liter of gas. Just now we can buy a bicycle because things real, things real, real dread. So before we get into the topic today, I'd like to give you one or two little anecdotes on the experiences I had. So, as you, if you've listened to my previous podcasts or previous episodes, I would have mentioned that I am a mechanical engineer. But also, I have had one or two or three or few car projects and I've worked on numerous of cars. I built my own special project already a few years ago. I say a few years but a little more than ten years ago a BMW 3 series 2.7 straight six. I've worked on a few of my friends' projects uh, before he came out to Barbados. I actually had to rebuild the entire car by myself. And that's basically what we did, did with the BMW as well. So I got some experience. Um, I always specialize, or I spend a lot of time in um, boat and yacht maintenance and repair and, and um, design. A, a engine is an engine is an engine is an engine. The sense is the same, nothing changes. So before I give you some tips and tricks, I want to first say things depend on your vehicle. And if you are fortunate enough to purchase a new vehicle, then you should be fortunate enough to also get a service manual and a maintenance manual. I know Bajans don't read those things, but it is a very, very, very important thing to read. It doesn't only familiarize you with your vehicle, but it also gives you the manufacturer's uh, recommendations for servicing, which should be followed. I also want to, 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 to let you know that you will find that a lot of car dealerships do not follow specifically uh, what the manufacturer says for various reasons sometimes it might be a case where the country is where the car is manufactured obviously it's different from Barbados because we don't make cars here but the climate is different so therefore you may have to do some adjusting to the service service hours uh, we are in a more humid country uh, and that has a lot of effects on tires on fuel consumption, on oil, the effects on oil, and how it lubricates your engine. So some manufacturers, some car dealerships will vary a little bit in terms of service hours. Also, you will find that some manufacturers are pushing a product, and the product is after sales. So you sell a car, and one thing that was the thing, you sell a car, you sell enough cars, you feel good. But no, the real money is in after sales so a lot of dealerships would recommend early servicing and early maintenance because it's business it's not necessarily care needs it it's business and you'll be very shocked to hear the things they do and charge you for and they want to give you an experience a personal experience we bought a car in 2016 i will not say the dealership and a part of it was three year well, they told us a five-year warranty and 
I think two free ser- first year services are free. So obviously they were doing that. Um, the other car I, I was driving, I did all the servicing uh, myself. So it was a new car. So if it's free, let them do it, right? And for a while, I guess it just became habit. Care to care to get service. Care to care to get service. But I remember in 2017, no, sorry, in 2018, December, I got a call from the, the, um, the dealership. And they said they couldn't reach my partner, so they called me instead. And so, so they called me to tell me, well, they 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 were doing the service, and they realized the car needs some additional work, and it's gonna call additional money. So they wanted my go ahead before they did it. I said, okay, well, just tell me what was the additional cost. They told me about five hundred dollars. So that would have brought the service to be. Just under a thousand dollars. I made mine a thousand dollars for car service. So I said, Well, could you please break down for me what is what is the additional work, right? Um, so I can have an idea, you know, because I service cars myself. So if it's something that I could do cheaper myself, she was okay. So this is a breakdown. They checked the engine oil and they realized they needed changing. As X amount of money. I can't remember all the figures offhand. They also wanted to change the transmission fluid. And they wanted to change the brake pads. And they realized that the, what was it? Oh, the wiper blades need changing. So was it, and this is $500? I said, how much is the wiper blades? Wiper blades was $215. So I mean, $215. A wiper blades I could get for less than twenty dollars. It doesn't sound right. Even if I spend thirty dollars, still don't sound right. So then my question became: Well, a oil change. Well, a, a transmission fuel change is not re- a regular service thing, so I could give away on that. But a oil change, and oil filter change is a regular service. That's part of a regular service, as well as changing spark plugs and that sort of stuff. When I wanted to change spark plugs. So I asked them, so what have I been paying 400 and somebody dollars for every couple of months? And she proceeded to tell me that they check the levels and if they need topping up, they will top them up. And they check the brakes and that sort of stuff, but they don't change them. But I told her, and then she told me that they wash, they've washed and validated care, which I have never ever been satisfied with because they never pay a Pay attention to details. So generally, the cars be good and clean, but you see running water streaks everywhere or on the glass, or they don't wipe the city car properly. So I have never been very keen on that part of your service. So I said to her, well, no, that doesn't make sense to me. What we'll do, I'll collect the car this evening, and I will service it myself. All of this time, this is more than two years, all this time I thought that this, this dealership was actually doing a service, and they never were doing a service. So, um, I went to a local car, um, car parts store, and they where I buy all my stuff from, and they purchase. I purchase the things I need. I needed. I needed spark plugs. I needed oil, oil filter, air filter for the AC. I changed the air filter for the um intake man, the intake system. Um. I bought brake pads. Change and I did all the service myself. I was so surprised that to find out to discover that when they started to remove the spark plugs, they were rusted. So all that time I was taking the car there, and they never changed the spark plugs, and I'm sure they got well over four thousand dollars out of us. That blew my mind. That blew my mind completely. And they almost had a fit. Needless to say, I no longer ever will care will care to dealership. And I've heard a lot of stories. I have friends that was that had small Yaris and they would take their car to a dealership to get service and pay like seven hundred dollars. And I was like, seven hundred dollars for a service, a regular service? I don't I can't picture what you could be doing for that type of money. Right? So yeah, 
Um, it's always good to. I'm not discouraging people to, to, to um, not to go to dealerships, but I will, I will encourage you to ask specifically what they do and get a breakdown of the cost. Not that you're thrifty, but it's your vehicle. You should know what you're paying for. Uh, we get in a habit of trusting people. Um, and at the end of the day, in my travels, I've learned that it's about a bottom line. It's about profits. It's about me, uh, reducing operating costs to maximize on your profit, right? And after sales is a massive, massive earner. So, stories aside, uh, let's start talking about things you could do to keep your vehicle running well, reduce your fuel consumption, and also save your save some money as a result of that. Uh, so before we get into that, I want to get into vehicle safety. Um, a lot of Barbadians don't know. There are some things that you are supposed to do by law, and I know a lot of us don't do it. I don't do it. I know you should do it, but you don't do it. But if you find yourself on the wrong side of the law, you can go and pay some money to the court. And one of the most simple things that we are supposed to do is inspect our vehicles. Now, inspection is very important because it allows you to identify issues before you go on the road. And one of the most basic inspections is a walk around your car. Make sure all of your lights are working. I see so many people driving around Barbados and one part light ain't working or one brake light ain't working or both tail lights ain't working or the lights above your License plate, or the bulbs weren't changing, and that is you can get reported for that. I have been reported for that, and it was at my vehicle, right? Um, and these things could save you money because if you are driving and a police officer see you with your lights of your your um license plates not working, then the light the license plate is not visible at night, and it's a chargeable offense. You're driving. Uh, with one brake light or no brake lights or part lights, that's a chargeable fence because it's against safety. You drain a rope and you don't know when your headlights blow or you got an electrical issue. You don't know because you're not checking your vehicle. And everybody ain't nice enough to stop you from the road and tell you, yeah, brother, you um, brake lights ain't working or you part lights ain't working or only one, you brake light, or one of your headlights working. You understand? So one of the first things you should do and you know you don't have to be in and about it you don't have to do it every single day but weekly on a weekend every couple of days just try to see that your lights are working that is extremely important that will save you money and time and agony before a judge also engine inspection in, um, inspections i like to keep my engine bays clean and my engines clean because if there's a leak they can easily identify it. if your engine bay is always dirty then you will not be able to see if something is going wrong so you don't need to get a wash down an engine wash down every month or you could do it once a month and then by yourself on the weekend just get a rag and wipe off areas while the engine is cold please don't do it after you just get home or don't start your engine and do it you wipe down your engine you wipe off, wipe off the dust and you look for oil splatter or oil stains or coolant stains because that would that would quickly let you know that something is wrong something you need to address if you don't if you don't know these things and you don't address them then they would they could turn into a bigger issue and generally keeping your car clean will also help you it's good if you could afford it that if you get minor scratches that you address them because minor scratches can turn into rust spots and bigger and larger more expensive repairs so we started with safety I think the simple thing is like checking your horn. I don't think I'll tell you that. Check and see if the kid is working, the headlights working, that sort of stuff. Uh, make sure when you turn your steering wheel, you're not hearing any weird noises or when you're driving, you hit. Because uh, you know, Barbie, this road is real bad. You got more potholes than we got road in certain places. Um, and you don't hear unnecessary noise, right? Like, like distinctive knocks or bangs or. Bottle like noises, like plastic balls, like crack, 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 crack. You know that's something wrong. And I've seen people ignore signs and drive the car and drive the car saying, oh, how it happened? Last week I saw two cars had a, a casualty in their axles because they probably um, needed a CV joint exchange and they're driving and hear that crunk, crunk, crunk when they turn a corner and, and then it get worse when you hear it 
when you wheel straight and you ignore it and then eventually it breaks and then now you damage your axle your cv joint possibly your suspension possibly your body of your carrier bumper your fender and you know that that went from a few hundred dollars it depends on your cv joint you get cv joint for hundred and somebody dollars at certain places or less so body repair new axle new cv joint probably swear bar damage drop lanes damage arms damage connect you know you don't know so it's be it would be great everybody don't got money all the time but sometimes it's good to bite the bullet and spend a little extra money now so it don't cost you a fortune later okay enough of that let's get into basic stuff so we spoke about batteries i'm uh, sorry we spoke about lights we talk about inspecting the car generally the engine bay that sort of stuff things like testing brakes you should do um, check your battery make sure that um, the battery ain't corroded you ain't seen that foamy or powdery stuff on the poles that means your battery leaking you should check that and it got some other implications for the electrics of your car now let's talk about maintenance basic maintenance of your car now if you have a manual and 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 this wonderful day of age you don't even need to get a manual you can go online and google your car the year the model you don't even need a chassis number and you could you could download a manual from the dealership right there are people that just get manuals electronically and just put them online you do that and you check to see what does the manufacturer not the car dealership the manufacturer the person that built the car their specifications and when you should maintain your car and usually it's done by months or the most accurate is by mileage so you know at 10,000 miles at 20,000 miles at 30,000 miles at 60 70 100,000 miles they tell you what your car should need your tachometer tells you um, the mileage so them strange then large strange numbers as on your dashboard should tell you what your mileage is and you work you work the suit you either go to your dealership or if you got a friendly mechanic somebody you could trust then you go to them and you talk to them about what you want and really and truly i see the i, I see the attraction of a dealership because a dealership will call you and tell you yes sir yes ma'am come in choose a your car need a service in our system by next week um it's easy and it, it's part of the product it may not be necessary but it's part of the product so you depend you decide what you want you pay more there, pay more there, whatever you're comfortable with. And if you got a big fancy car, like a Rolls Royce, a Mercedes, a Jaguar, you ain't doing that, you ain't carrying out to no regular mechanic. So if you got that sort of money to buy in vehicles, this probably is not your concern. Because <laughs> you probably won't care to nobody but you do the shit. But it's always still good to ask what specifically they are doing. Because because you got a lot of money doesn't mean that you know you want get very basic so let's talk about basic maintenance now i know people that believe that there's always be this debate about should you let your car warm up or should you let your car idle for a while before you start to drive this is my take on it and it has implications for maintenance as well right and this is the issue the issue is that um when you buy oil the oil oil is sold by specifications so there's a number there a number there's a number followed by a letter followed by two other numbers right now that those numbers and letter indicates the specifications of the oil the working temperatures and the viscosity so when you see um 5w 30 it says that the five means at five degrees in winter if viscosity is 30 it can maintain that viscosity at, at that temperature right in the caribbean we don't need to worry about the first the first number and the first letter because we got we between 27 to 30 degrees annually which is close to to, to working temperature right 
So your care, if you were in a cold country, you would need to start your care um, and let it warm up. Back in the day, they had something called a choke. You had to pull and push in. It's, the only thing I see on chokes now is lawnmowers and weed whackers. Now everything is electronic, so you don't need to do that. The care is automatically start. You see the ref going to go up. Um, there are thermal, there are oxygen sensors and thermal switches that lets your car know, or rather, um, have by metal switches. So when it gets a certain temperature, then your car knows to draw the revolutions. Your radiator has a thermal a thermostat that deals with um, boiling temperatures. So when your when your coolant gets at probably ninety, it depends on the car, but 92, 98, 99 degrees, hundred degrees. It would open and allow the coolant to run through the car because that's the car's working temperature. The very easy way to determine if your car needs to idle before you start, before you drive away, when you start in the morning or evening, is, is you don't even need to discuss it. Start your car. The revs are going to go up just above 1,000 RPMs, 1,000 RPMs, or 1. But maybe go 1 to 8. 1 to 10 depends on the type of car you have. Some is 1 to 4, some is 1 to 5. When that needle falls back down below 1, which is normal idling, idling revolutions, right? Your car is ready to move. Very simple. If you start a car and just start a drive, in a short space of time, it will not cause any damage to your car. Because we are in the tropics, we are is very fast. Your car will get to work. It damages extremely fast because we're already hot. You might see, you might never see any damage if you do it every single day, all the time. For a long period of time, um, it would it would might cause damage to your crankshaft or might cause damage to your camshaft because the issue is your car needs to heat up so the lubricant, the oil, can run through the system and lubricate everything. Because when your car is off, all the oils drop, all the oil drops back into the oil sump, which which collects all the oil. You start the car, the pump pushes that oil throughout the car and lubricates everything. And that's the purpose of, of, of that idle. There are cars now that come with pre-idling. BMWs for sure, they have one. Have one. Mercedes, all the other cars, you start the car. And before before you get the ignition, you turn F is electronic start, you hear the fuel pump come on. So it, it primes everything with, with fuel. And then the oil pumps go, comes on, it primes the oil, the oil goes through the car, and then the car starts. So it all depends on your car. If you got an older model car, well, you know, just watch that 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 um, rev counter. When that rev needle goes up initially, uh, initial start, and it falls back down and it's steady, you know your car is ready to move. And it does not take minutes. It does it, sometimes it takes seconds, probably a minute the most, but it all depends on your vehicle, engine size, that sort of stuff. Now servicing. I'm not going to tell you service a car every three months, six months, every year, because it all depends on how much miles you do. So everybody uh, will not have the same period for servicing. And if you don't pay attention to it, then you might run into trouble. But um, if you buy oil, the oil, if you, if you read the specifications, the specifications will tell you, Temperatures and hours, that sort of stuff. You get some more information on it. Generally, in Barbados, is here people say every three months, every six months. I think three months is excessive. Um, it all depends on the type of parts you buy as well. I think sometimes even six months could be excessive, but it depends on the amount of driving you do. If you do a lot of driving, then it might be necessary for you to do six months, right? But oil lasts long. But let's talk about the components that you normally change on a normal, regular service. Now, the first thing, um, it depends on the money that you are spending. And I can explain why. For instance, there are people that buy cheap spark plugs. Toyota, Suzuki, people, and Nissan's, all the metals will, will probably spend $30, $40 on spark plugs. Those spark plugs will not last long. What I do, I buy uranium spark plugs or dual tip or four tip spark plugs. So you know that when I buy spark plugs and install them, these spark plugs will last me at the very least two years or more. So when they do services, I don't need to look back at my spark plugs within a year or within two years because they know I, I, I spend $104 on 
on four spark plugs. When I, was, when I had the BMW, it was 75 spark plugs for six spark plugs. So I knew that it was a, it was a painful at the, at the beginning. But if I buy a four tip spark plug, that's three years, four years, I ain't gonna look back at them spark plugs. And I'm buying Denzos, right? Well, I needed to buy Denzos for that car. So the car I have now, um, I will buy Iridium spark plugs, single or dual tip. I know I, I don't have to look back at them for two years. So I study if I spend $30, and I gotta change them every three months. That's four times in a year, four trees. That's 120 already. I gonna pass you the $104. And then I got multiplied by two again. So you spend a lot more money buying cheap plugs than I would buying proper plugs. So the first thing is spark plugs. Um, you could go to your dealership or you could go to your mechanic or you could go to your uh, part supplier and they will have information on you. Um, they could tell you, you tell them the car you got the model, they will tell you um, this will work. They have a list and they have all that experience. And you tell them, listen, I don't want cheap ones. I want iridium plugs that can last me longer, two years. They say, I got you. It may cost a little bit of money now. It can save you a lot more money in the long run. Oh, in short and medium run, um, run as well. That's one of the first things. The second thing you should change in a regular service is your oil and oil filter. Now, your oil is what lubricates your engine. Is what creates... Um, viscosity, which is just lubrication, a barrier between metal. So it prevents metal from rubbing on metal and it goes short the car. Right? On a very small scale, it also works um, as a transfer of heat as well. But generally, your main um, transfer of heat apparatus is your coolant and your radiator. But we can get to that. So your oil has a uh, have operating temperatures and it has operating temperatures for a period of time or a, a number of hours or kilometers and it's very easy to determine if your oil needs changing changing when you open your engine bay there's a dipstick that dipstick for the oil when you pull it out you get a clean piece of white paper or tissue and you wipe it off first you, you take it out you wipe it off first you dip it in you pull it out. You're doing two things. At the end of the stick, there are two levels. Some have notches, some have lines, some have L, some have H. To indicate to you if you have low amounts of oil in your oil in your oil sump, or the accurate amount of oil, or too much oil. Generally, too much oil does not make a difference, but in certain cars, they do. For instance, Mitsubishi has an issue where I call it issue. If you put too much oil in a Mitsubishi, the engine knocks. If you put too little oil in a Mitsubishi, the engine still knocks. What is an engine knock? An engine knock is just basically your car is not adequately being lubricated. So you're not getting that protective layer between metals. And then metal on metal rubs and then engine freezes. So for instance, in your... And I got different types of knocks, but I don't want to get too deep. I just want to keep it very basic for everybody. So the first thing you're doing is checking the level of oil in your engine. The next thing you're doing is when you look at that paper, you can see the quality of oil. Now, I like people to look at oil in the first bet and see how it looks, the color and the clarity of it, just like wine or beer. And then look at it when it's dirty. And you can see a vast difference. It goes from something you can see through that looks clean to something that's dark and gunky. But what you're also doing is checking the quality of the oil. So if your oil is too dark, um, it means your oil is probably ready to be changed soon. What happens if you don't change your oil? Oil breaks down in heat and over time. So what be, what start started as a lubricant ended up become becoming slime or gunky. I could turn it to like a gel. And you don't ever want to get it out. But anytime you get to that stage, your engine is probably done with. So you don't want that gunkiness. Um if you go on YouTube and you look at a video. You can see what it looks like, a gunky. It looks like slime, like tar. And that consistency will destroy your engine. And if it gets to that, if it gets to that stage, it's probably destroyed. We've got to get a whole engine pulled down, change bearings, change all sorts of stuff. And you don't want to get to that point. So you test, you test your oil every couple of months to make sure um, it's not too dirty. And it's always great, people. It's always great to write down somewhere. And you've got all these new fancy uh, devices. 
somewhere where you had your car last service. And once you could do that, then you know, well, look, I do a service, right? So oil, never change your oil and never and, and not change your oil filter. And why is this important? If you have particles in your oil, shavings or any contaminants, it will store in your filter. And if you put in new oil and it's in your, and the old filter is still on the car, what you're doing is contaminating the new oil with this dirty filter. So you will never see any respectable mechanic or service company change oil and not change your oil filter. Because your oil filter's job is to filter and clean the oil, keep contaminants out of your engine. And if you, if you don't do that, then what's happening, you're contaminating your oil and you're reducing the life and the amount of time your oil will work in your car. Next thing is always change your oil filter, your air filter. The quality of your airflow mixture, fuel and air. Um, one of the things is the quality of the oil, um, the gas and the quality of the air coming in. So we drive in, you know, barbecue roads, we dusty, we drive over a lot of stuff, on leaves and stuff, and some things that can get trapped in your air filter. Um, you don't always have to change it. it. It depends on how often you clean it. So you, but if you're servicing your car, you change the, oil, the air filter, and that's just twenty five dollars, fifteen dollars, depending on the car. So those are the basic things that you change on a general service. You change the oil, you change the spark plugs. Um, unless you buy expensive ones, then you need to make um, determine how long they last and make sure that you keep going inside them. Change your air filter. Um, it's always good to check your coolant levels all the time. Not only when you're getting service, but outside of that, every couple of weeks, every couple of months. I do not use water in my, in my radiator. I prefer coolant. And the reason why I prefer coolant is because it lasts longer, is almost maintenance free. I just need to make sure the levels are maintained and there are different ways to check the levels. Now, we spoke about maintenance. I always like to check your brakes as well uh, when you're doing the service because uh, you can identify if your brake pads need changing. If um, you are below half of the, the thickness of your brake pads, then you need to change them. And if you don't change them, you, I, I service a friend of mine's car the other day, and he changed his pads and CV joints and whatever. And his, yeah, all around this. And his front, this brakes were gone, completely gone. He was actually driving and braking on the shoe itself. Just the metal that, that holds the pad together. And that is completely dangerous because what happens is you've got metal on metal instead of um, whatever uh, material or specific brake. Because everybody, you don't use asbestos anymore, but there's different uh, materials they use. Friction material, friction rated materials. And what he was doing is by doing that, he was creating metal on metal. And two, a series, a series of things can happen. Firstly, metal on metal creates heat. So then the car would not stop. Metal on metal can also create fusion. And it can fuse the brake shoe and the brake can fuse together, causing you to slide and get into the accident. It damages your rotor. Your rotor is the part that the brake actually uses slows down to stop your car and then if you cut into the rotor then you need to take off the rotors take it to a machine shop and get it um plain get level out or you might possibly need to buy new rotors not a good thing rotors are expensive trust me very expensive even for a cheap car so i realize that my time is running away so i can try to condense it a little bit more so basic maintenance keep the engine clean keep the engine bay clean Whip it down once in a while, get it all washed, get it in your bed washed on, the body washed on once in a while, and try to maintain it so you don't gotta do it too often. That will allow you to be able to see if there are leaks anywhere. Check your car safety, make sure your lights working, your harness working, your indicators working. Keep the car generally clean. It would um it will help save you money in the long run. Try to deal with scratches early so you don't end up with rust spots or having to change your door because it completely rusts out. On the inside that you don't even know when you're servicing always change the oil always change the oil filter always change the um spark plugs always change the air filter to the car 
And you know, change the air filter to the AC as well. Can I help? Is the air you're breathing in? Come on. Um, I don't want to get into servicing ACs because that's a different thing. And usually we just run the AC till it don't work no more. I didn't get service. But that's something you can check every year, once a year. There are a lot of people here in Barbados that do it. They come to your house, um, change your change your O-rings in the AC system because some things they get flat and then the gas has skipped. We gas and it's not expensive, like hundred dollars, hundred and ten dollars. I don't want to price anybody's work. I've only paid possibly the most I've ever paid is $120. And that, that person change all the O-rings, um, do a purge system check for leaks, and then regas, and that's something that you wanted then, right? Specifically. But, I don't praise people work. Keep your car generally clean, we went through that stuff. Now, here's another thing. We can get into the fuel part, tips and tricks to help with fuel consumption. And they are so simple, that when they tell you, you might laugh at me. The first tip to reduce fuel consumption is to Gradually, gradually accelerate and gradually break. I see a lot of people that they're at stop signs or around the boats. And as they get a chance, fuck any poison. Yes, down to the bottom. And boom, that is going to cause you to use a lot of gas. These Barbados, it's small. Every place close. There's no need to rush. If you leave home 10 minutes earlier, you will need to rush. I used to always leave home. I think I'll get some place. I, I live in St. Thomas. I think I'll get to St. Philip at 2 o'clock. I just left home at 1 o'clock. And I just take my time and get there because I ain't gonna waste the gas and I ain't gonna be stressed out. And when I get right going, I ain't gonna be anxious from the adrenaline. Right? So leave home a little earlier. Start pressing up my gas. I'm breaking hard. I'm digging off again. That is going to waste that's going to waste your fuel the next thing um, that wastes fuel is a lot of long idling so obviously you start you wait for somebody your car windows roll up the ac blowing you listen to music all that time your car is idling you're you're consuming fuel fuel is what keeps the engine running right also using a lot of ac is also care your fuel consumption because the ac runs off of a belt that uses the crankshafts revolutions to keep running so you ever realize that your AC is blow different when you are stationary than when you're actually driving it's blow harder when you're driving but when you stop it's kind of slow down because it's really it's work in tandem with your crankshaft so if you're using a lot of AC you can use, you can use more fuel another thing um, that also increases your fuel consumption is driving around with a lot of weight in your car. You got a lot of tools, you got a lot of people all the time, you got a lot of heavy things in your car, your car can work harder to do the same speed. So you're gonna you need more fuel to go the same distance if you got more people in your vehicle. So if you have on net or, or stuff, so if you have unnecessary heavy stuff or unnecessary stuff in your car whatsoever, then you could eliminate it, go to the car and do that. Because over time, if they're not very heavy, but over time, if they will, they will not take, the consumption would be great in a short space of time. But if it's very heavy, then you will see that you will burn a lot of gas. And you may not even understand why. Another thing um, is tire pressure. So a lot of people don't understand that tire pressure also plays a serious role in your safety driving but also your fuel consumption so in barbados i grew up hearing this this rule unwritten rule about putting 35 pounds of pressure of air in your tires now for the life of me i don't even know where that came from but everybody in barbados do it everybody in barbados is do it except me <laughs> they don't do it they put like 44, 43, or I may put it at 40. Now, this is the reason why. Firstly, if you want to put 35 pounds of pressure in your car, and you put it at 35, you necessarily may not, you will not get 35 pounds in your tires. And they don't trust 
the the air pumps at the gas stations are always never working to have an error control. So if I want 35, I can't put the pump at 35. I gotta put it at probably 38 or 40. The second reason why you don't do it is putting more is because each tire that you buy has its own specification for air pressure. And that you can find on the tire. So you know you look at when you buy tires, you buy the tire but the size of the tire, so the size of the rim. So if it's 17, 16, 15, some things be R or depends on the brand of tire, the type of tire you bang. And then on the height and width of the tire. So 115, so 15, 115 or 15, um, 120, that's the height or the width. And the profile, sorry, 40s, 45s, 55s, 50s, 60s, depends on if it's a car or a truck. But right next to that, you will see something called maximum pressure, minimum pressure. Usually you'll see them around 44 pounds um, square inch of maximum pressure, but it all depends on your car. So if you, and if you have low profile tires, then you're going to need tubeless low profile. You're going to need more pressure because on a Subaru, I had uh, almost run fats and their pressure was like 56. And I, I've seen people with racing tires at 70. And you know, it, so it all depends. So it's important to you look at your tire, look at the information and read the information and see what pressure you should have. And if you don't know how to do that, there's the internet. Um, you could just Google tire information or how to read your tire and it has it tells you all sorts of things the width of the tire the height of the tire the, the what size rim the tire is for what type of ride the tire is for what sort of tarmac the car is for the tire is for wet dry wet and dry mud it even tells you what year uh, what week in the year the tire was made it also tells you the expiration date of the tire maximum minimum uh, pressure tells you when carrying load what pressure to put on the tire and that sort of stuff you get all the information for your tire every single tire has it is a ISO international standard now why is tire pressure important if your tire is too hard that's a safety issue but if it's too hard your car your tire your rate is going to be real stiff you may not consume more fuel but your rate is going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be unsafe because if you break too hard the car is going to is prone to slide more and if you corner too hard, you're prone to understeer or maybe on this oversteer. Depends if it's a rear view drive or front view drive. What is oversteer? Oversteer is when you're cornering and the rear of the car comes around and you can lose control. Understeer is when you're driving, and you turn your steering wheel and the car keeps straight, which is the most scariest, the scariest thing you ever experience in your life is understeer. If your tire does not have enough pressure, it means that your car is going to control a lot better. It has more control on the road because it is softer. It will spread out on the road. But the problem with that is that if it's too soft, then it needs more energy to turn. And more energy means that you you need to put your foot a bit harder on the gas to go the same distance, but you're going to use more fuel. So if your, car is under, your tires are under pressure, you're going to use a lot more fuel that's necessary to run the same trip. Another thing that I do to conserve fuel is I, I course so I live in St. Thomas our, and when I go down Shop Hill I put my car in neutral keep my foot on the brake I maintain positive control of the steering wheel all the time and I course as far as I could go I do the same thing coming coming from Redmond Village to Warrens I do the same thing going down UV Hill and any hills I do that because when the car is in neutral it uses less fuel than when it's in drive when you are moving in some vehicles, when you're stationary, the computer is programmed to use less fuel in drive than it is in neutral. So it all depends on your, your vehicle. And it's easy to determine if you are driving and you stop. Let's say you're in a car park, you stop. You put your, your cars in, in drive, watch the rev counter. And when you put it in neutral, see if it goes up and comes down. And then you will know which, which is more efficient to be stationary in neutral or stationary in in park or stationary and drive it depends it um, depends on your car I necessarily I generally don't like to idle long um, unless it's a work thing because I don't want to put my car in park and the engine running I don't want to keep my car in, in drive I want to keep my foot on brake and the engine running because it 
when you got the carrying drive, the carrying won't go forward. So I will put it in neutral. So if I need a drive through, I usually put the carrying neutral. Right? The reason we don't put it in part because it's a drive through the pace, you don't stick it long. You know? It's all up to you. It's what you're comfortable with. So tire pressure is very important when it comes to fuel consumption. Another another step to save fuel is the speed at which you drive at. Funny enough, the the speed laws in Barbados is technically not only safety, but it's also for fuel consumption. Because if you drive your car between 40 and 60, and sometimes 70, 80, that is economic that economic zone, right? So if you're driving beyond that, your performance is, is going to be higher. Your fuel consumption is going to be economical for that speed you're going at. But generally, you are mu using a lot more fuel because you're going faster and it's not necessary. And then obviously, if you're going faster, that means you got to brake harder. So you can you can use a lot more brakes. You can rid on your brakes faster. And then once you're on that adrenaline rush, then what can happen is that when you stop and you get a chance to move again, Foot any poison again, going on hard again, racing fuel. So driving between 40 and um, 60, 80 is economical speed. If your car has cruise control, cruise control is designed to keep your car at economical speed. If you have a bit more, um, a flashier car, Mercedes, new, newer BMWs, Range Rovers, that's Jaguars, that sort of stuff, where your car um, is designed to shut down fuel, cylinders when you are in traffic to save um, fuel then you don't need to do that you, you might then you be in traffic you hear a car next to you start up when it start to move off and really start up is that the it it might be a four cylinder six cylinder eight cylinder v6 v12 whatever but it's designed only to use as much cylinders as necessary to save fuel so then when you put your foot on gas again the other cylinders just start up and you go on depends on how much gas you apply so those are some ways to save fuel. There are a few more. I I already gone over time. Another way is I, 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 I'm very cautious when I say this. So making sure your car is more aerodynamic. If you buy a car, generally it's designed for mass for aerodynamics. If you buy a normal sedan for a car, you're not you're not gonna do this part. But I see a lot of people, you know, like to buy wings and but downforce, things on the bumpers to control the air that moves around a car. So aerodynamics is just basically how air moves around your car. And if it's design restrict, um, prevents restriction of air. So the air should really run across the side of your cars, above and underneath your car, and not um, hit a solid mass that would act as an air brake. Right? Just like a plane to stop, a plane to stop off of air brakes. So those are general things uh, you could do to reduce fuel consumption. General things you could do to maintain your car. Right? And the last thing I want to do to help you do both, which is reduce your fuel consumption and also to for longevity of your car and maintain your car, is practice predictive driving. This is what I do. Um, and if, you, if that's not too technical, drive like everybody else on the road about to do stupidness. So I don't look at the car in front of me. I look at the car in front of me and two cars in front of him. I don't only look at the cars in front of me. I also look my rear view mirror and my side mirrors to the cars behind me and see what they are doing. Because you, someone in front, the car in front of you, it will do something that cause the person in front of you not to realize or to do something to react. And then you're not paying attention that you find yourself scrambling, hard braking or swerving. And if you're not being a defensive driver or a predictive driver, you'll find yourself in a lot of issues. I've seen people do so much madness. Is this for instance, um, in Rema Village, coming down from Corsales, going to Warrens, they put Merge lane. Now, in all the other countries I've been to, merge lane only works one way. You come up to the merge lane, left, right, left, right. So a car on the right goes, a car on the left goes. A car on the right goes, a car on the left goes. And that's how merges work. In Barbados, for some reason, Barbadians 
it's feel hard then boy if you then feel that you ain't getting in front of them and they don't know why an ambulance said they ripped me off because i was in the merge lane he was far behind me but as he see that i was coming over he decided to drive fast and try to force me off the road i stopped because it was an ml vehicle because although i would have let him hit me and get it right i didn't have the time i did not have the time to deal with that and i didn't want the frustration right and the agony against that process because he was wrong and if any police come and see where he was and where he was he was wrong but i don't know why why we drive that way in barbados like we are not generally courteous on the road um when it comes to letting out people when it comes to mergers i don't know i don't know i don't know what what everybody is always in a rush this is an island you know what i'm saying hurry up and wait don't matter where you get so we're on time you get an appointment somewhere you go to the doctor you got emergency you go to the qh you get qh as much emergency as it is you gotta wait seven hours you know what i'm saying so they may come and give you first aid triage and then put you when you stable enough for them put you somewhere to wait for hours so people there's no need to be driving fast all the time there's no need not to be courteous on the road learn how to use the runabouts learn how to use the mergers left right left right it can't kill you for one body in front of you i don't know what's the issue with barbadians so i have gone way beyond the time i usually do i want to thank you very much for this today this has been another episode episode six diy tips tricks for keep your vehicle working good and tips and tricks on how to save fuel thank you again listening to episode seven Please check out all of my handles on YouTube, RTA with Jack. Instagram, RTA with Jack. Anchor, RTA with Jack. Also have a WordPress website, RTA with Jack. I'm going to post all of them underneath the, the description for the video and audio. I also want you to, or I want to encourage you to like. If you like what you said, if you, if you learn anything from it, just hit that like button. Can't do you nothing. Just be courteous. If you have an issue, if you have a question, if you're concerned about something you said, if you need more clarification, it's okay. Just hit comment, type your comment, or email me. I will respond to it. I can respond to it however you want me to respond to it via the same email on social media or on the next podcast. I can address you. Just let me know how you want it. That's no problem. And you know what? If you hit that, that subscribe button, that bell on YouTube, then every time I post a new podcast or a new video, or on my website i know have something called rti bytes i just give you small snippets of information whether it be motivation daily motivation life motivation anything like that you will be informed so you have been listening to random thoughts and ideas with jack rti with jack have a great week have a great day have a great thought have a great thing and be careful i don't know i say we had to say it I, I i share my random thoughts with you Tell me what you think, tell me what you think. Mad Saints?